and the fingers have a 90 degree angle to the back of the head. And then they pull this up um, so that this phalanx is the same level as the back of the hand and stretch it back down. Yeah. And that's to avoid, it's not this, it's going down. And the easiest way to do that is on a piece of furniture. It doesn't have to be an $80,000 Steinway. And then I have them do it in the air and make sure that they don't use their wrists. So uh, the wrist can be, and your arm can all be one line. Mm -hmm. and, and then this, yeah, once they can do this, um, first I ask them to put the thumb in the first joint of the middle finger, which restricts the motion a little bit, but that's close to a bow. Then have them hold the bow vertically, and then I have to hold the bow weight, um, and do the same thing. Um, the thumb participates in the action and goes from curled all the way from the bow hair to straight, but not to a locked position. That's, that's the main thing. When that works, we put it on the string, and it gives you about a centimeter or a centimeter and a half of, of a stroke. So we call it a finger stroke. And it's important, neither the arm nor the hand, uh, the back of the hand or the wrist participate in it. I always like to hold students' hands. So it's just this, yeah. which works only with what's called the Franco-Belgian bow grip. Um, it doesn't work with the Leopold Auer <laughs> Russian bow grip. Um, and I'm not here to say that either Milstein or Heifetz were inferior violinists. <laughs> and it can be done, but then they have to do all of these functions from the arm, which is more tricky, but it's possible. Yeah. So once they have this, that becomes the beginning of every Martin Lee stroke from here on. So they push the bow down in the direction of the stroke. The string makes a tiny Helmholtz arm. Um, and then the first thing that happens is as the pressure releases, the finger motion, and it doubles the speed with the arm motion. Yeah. And that always makes it clean, Martin, yes.